All right, so Luke chapter 9, verses 57 uh, through 62. We have been talking about fixing the ship, things that, that need to happen within the church and within the, the believers, within the body of Christ, things that need to happen as God moves. And I'm not talking about programs. I'm not talking about things. God has a desire for us, and He has a plan for us, and we need to be seeking that plan. Not programs, not things, but clear direction from God as to where He wants us to move, because we know that Christ is the head of the church, and He is leading the church, and all of these things with a heart for revival. There is a need for genuine revival among the church, among believers, and we talked last week that uh, first and foremost, we looked at the book of 1 John. We, we almost did like a full synopsis of 1 John. And we talked that everything of 1 John, he was wanting them to know that they knew that they knew that they knew that they were saved. And he even said, I'm writing these things that you may have joy that, and knowing that you are saved. Having that assurance and salvation is a source of joy. And he talked about how those things were manifest in our life, the evidences of those things in our life as we love God, love the brethren, love the church, all of those things, because revival necessitates knowing that you are saved. You have to have the inworking of the Spirit in your life for a revival to happen. And so now, looking further, the, need, the heart for personal revival is all founded around a dedication to being discipled, to being a disciple of Christ. And so if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be reading, starting with verse 57, and we'll actually probably continue into chapter 10, verse 12. It says this, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, speaking of Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another, this is a third person, another said, also said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. After these things the Lord appointed seventy others also. And he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road, but whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And the Son of Peace is there. If, and the Son of Peace is there. Your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house, wherever city you enter, and, who, and they receive you. Eat such things as are set before you. Heal the sick there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter, and they do not receive you, go out in the street and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. But I say to you, there will be more tolerable in that day, in that day for Sodom and Gomorrah than that city. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, and Lord, I pray that you will open up your word to us. Lord, that just as Jesus was speaking to those who were standing there, the word that Jesus spoke to the disciples, to those who were gathered, Lord, is just as relevant 
and meaningful and impactful today to us as it was to them who heard it then. Lord, today, I pray that we will commit ourselves to being discipled by you, to being obedient and following you wherever you lead us. Lord, I pray for those who are here today, Lord, if there's anyone who doesn't know you, that today they will take that first step, the first step of yielding their life in salvation and accepting you as Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, I pray for those who are here today that have, have been away for a while, Lord, that today, Lord, that you will spark renewed passion, a renewed fire in hearts. Lord, today, challenge us, encourage us, but most importantly, may your word transform us, may it speak to us, may we have ears to hear it, and Lord, may you be glorified. Remove me out of the way, Lord, nobody wants to hear the thoughts of Philip, Lord, today, we want to hear what you have to say to your church. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So if you look at um, the context of what's going on in this passage in Luke, um, this is a time period, most people think it's probably when that six-month window before Jesus is going to Jerusalem, more than likely somewhere between the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Passover, is this time. Jesus was under continual threat. He was continually, any time he showed up in Jerusalem, um, they were set to kill him. And there, during this time period, he is in the eastern area to the Jor of the Jordan. So he is in the Perean area. This is the area to the east of the Jordan. And it says in Luke 9 that from that moment, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. At this point, Jesus is moving with direction and with purpose that nothing would deter him from going to Jerusalem. And he even knew what was waiting in Jerusalem. Because if you look back in chapter 9, verse 43, it says this. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink down in your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them, so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. You see, Jesus reveals in that moment that he knows that the purpose of what is going to happen in Jerusalem is his death, burial, and resurrection. He knows he is going to be betrayed by Judas. He knows that he's going to be handed over to the guards. He knows that he is going to be whipped. He knows he's going to be paraded through the streets and beaten. And he knows he is going to be hung on the cross. But he set, it says he set his face. That is a wording of determination. He said, I am setting my face that I am heading to the plan in which God has set forth for me. You see before this that Jesus sent out the 12 disciples and he equipped them to go in to cast out demons and all of these things. And then in this chapter we see where he is sending out 70 before him to go into all the areas that he is about to go into. He has equipped them. He has prepared them to go out. And he gives them power even over demons. Because think about this. All of spiritual warfare in the world was centered around Jerusalem in that moment. Why? Because it was the epicenter of what Jesus was about to do to re restore and to redeem all of humanity. You wonder why there is so much demonic stuff going on when you read throughout the New Testament, I mean, the, the Gospels? Satan was actively working to stop the plan of God. But Jesus says he set his face to go before them. And now when you look at this, you see three stories and some context in the midst of these. The calling of these, these people was particular to this moment, to this time, for this purpose. He was calling them out to go forth as his disciples before him. And to each one, there's a different thing that they look at him and say, Lord, I will follow you, but... 
But let me do this. But let me do that. Let me get this in order or that in order. And each one of those are particular to them. And even if you look in Matthew 19, we're not going to turn there, but you, you know the story of the rich young ruler, the one who came to Jesus and said, I want to inherit eternal life. And Jesus looks at him and says, keep all the law. And he says, I've done it since my youth. You see, there was a heart issue that he exposed. He said, okay, there's one more thing that you lack. Go and sell all your possessions and follow me. It says he went away sad. Why? Because to him, the possessions were more important than Jesus. They were more important. You see throughout Scripture where there's times where God blessed people with possessions. Why was that particular thing an issue for the rich young ruler? Because honestly, that was where his treasure was. Was in the things, the possessions. And Jesus, with one commandment, exposed what was holding him back. That one but this. That was the one thing that was holding him back. To everyone who is called must be willing to yield anything they are called to by the master. You see, this becomes the focal point of discipleship. That if Jesus calls you to give up something, that you were willing to give it up for his sake. And I also want to clarify that, because I had one person who came to, me set, uh, came to me and said, God's called me to divorce my wife and to marry, the, God's called me to marry and be with this person. I was like, well, first of all, God's not going to call you to do something that goes against his word. Okay? That is not a biblical explanation. God is not going to call you to do something that goes against his word. But God does call us as believers to be willing to yield everything to him. And I will tell you something. When we begin to put something in our life as more important than Jesus, that calling is coming. God will look and say, there you shall have no other gods but me. For I am what? A jealous God. God desires to be your priority. And you look at this and the three things, the very first one, before the person even responds, but he looks at the Lord, he says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus, knowing the person's heart, looks at him and says, if you're going to follow me, you're not going to have a permanent home. You're going to be traveling. You're going to be moving. You're not going to have a place to lay your head that's going to be a permanent place. The second one looks at him, and this was one of my grandmother's favorite verses. I'm actually, this is a, this passage, that verse, I actually preached at her funeral. You want to talk about an odd, odd message to preach at a funeral when it says, let the dead go bury the dead. But he was looking at them and saying, Jesus, let me go get my affairs in order. What would happen in Jewish culture is the, especially, and there's speculation around what's going on in this passage, for the oldest son would stay around to receive the blessing, which would be the inheritance, and to be there to bury the father. So it's not saying that he has actually died at that point. He's looking saying, let me get my household or affairs in order, and then I will come and follow you. The next one, he looks and says, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. He says, let me at least go home and say goodbye. And Jesus looks at him and says, no. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And we'll talk about that, that wording of that in just a minute. But he looks at him and says, This is the calling that he was giving to those at that moment to drop everything and follow him. And the reason for that, there is purpose in this. 
All of these, why was, why was God calling them to do this? Why was Jesus calling them to do this at this moment? And you see that in chapter 10 because Jesus had set his face to Jerusalem and then just as he sent out the 12 before him, he now takes 70, the 12 disciples plus 70 more, and he sends them out into the cities that he's about to come, go to. Time is short. The crucifixion is coming. And he looks and says, Now I need you to follow me. And to go before me, proclaiming the name of the Lord. But they all responded with, I will, but let me first do this. What are the things in your life that when God calls you to do something, that you respond with, but God, let me do this first. It always amazed me as with working with teenagers, because I would have teenagers look at me, and, and we would talk about the coming of the Lord and all these things. And, and, and this is just honest moment with teenagers. They would look at me and go, I want to, I want to go to heaven. I want Jesus to come back, but I'd like to get married first and, and have a family and these things. And it's like, is that the priority? I want to do what you want me to do, God. But first, I want to do what I want to do. I will follow you. Just let me follow you in a little bit. For the, for the one who was wanting to go home and bury his father, he says, let the dead, those who are spiritually dead, bury the physical dead. If he had gone home, he would have missed out because possibly by the time his father died, Jesus would have been dead and in the grave and resurrected for the third, on the third day. What is the I will but of your life? He was calling them and sending them forth to do something very important. And that was to proclaim the coming of the Lord. If you look back in Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And this is prophecy that will be fulfilled also. Uh, that's referring to that of um, John the Baptist. And his work in preceding Christ. As being the front runner preparing the way it says this comfort yes comfort my people says your God speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare has ended her iniquity is pardoned for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way I always go I always go King James in there sorry prepare the way of the Lord Make straight in the desert a highway for the, your God. For every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made, uh, made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then we see this passage also used of John the Baptist, who came as the pre-runner, the precursor of Christ. And he says, he is the one in the wilderness crying out, prepare ye the way of the Lord. They were to be forerunners going forth. And this tying to them in this moment, what were they doing? They were forerunners going before Jesus to pre prepare these cities for Jesus to arrive there. If you look over at Matthew 3. You see that quoting, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Also, look over at Luke. Go forward to Luke 1. And you see the prophecy regarding John the Baptist. Luke 1, verse 16. 
speaking of the coming of John the Baptist the, while he is in the womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You look at this, every bit of what John the Baptist was doing was to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Jesus sends out these 70 disciples for the express purpose for them to prepare for the coming of Jesus. And church, what has he called for us to do? To prepare for what? His second coming. This is, refer- this is relating to us today because we are the ones in the world today that are to be proclaiming the coming of Jesus Christ. And so now, relating these things to us, what does revival have to do with the midst of this? They were going forth to proclaim because the harvest is truly great. They were to go out and prepare for Jesus coming to these cities, proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, just as we are to be doing. And that is where revival and discipleship come in together. When we are disciples and we are willing to lay down anything for what God calls us to do, we go forth proclaiming the message of the gospel and He who is coming. And so why, how do these things tie in? Application to our life today in this is time was short. There was not time for this moment for them to go home and say goodbye to people. There was not time for them to go home to take care of family affairs. There was not time at that moment for them to get their ha- build a house or anything. They were going to be on the move. And in church, today, we have to understand the need for us to understand that time is short. And there needs to be imme- immediacy in obedience. Nehemiah is at that age where you tell him to do something and let me do this first. Nehemiah, we need to clean up. Well, I want to finish playing with this and then I'll clean up. Or let me finish watching this. And he has become the king of stalling. I'm sure none of you parents in this room have ever had a kid that knew how to stall before bedtime or anything else. Church, we have become the kings and queens of stalling. God, yeah, I'm, I, I want to follow you, but first let me do this. When God calls, there needs to be an immediacy in obedience in responding to Him when He calls us. How many, t- how many times have you looked and someone pass away and, and you think, I wish I'd have shared the gospel with this person. God gave me so many opportunities to share the gospel. And I missed them. And now they're gone. And now I don't know if they had accepted Christ or not. Think in your life, when God calls you to share the gospel with somebody, you don't know if that is their last moment on this earth. You don't know if tomorrow will be here. You don't know if there's enough time, but God, let me... Give me another opportunity. Now's not the right moment. There needs to be immediacy in our obedience. But also, this mindset of I will but hinders our usefulness in the kingdom. That word fit, when he says, um, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That word in the Greek is used three times, and it literally means useful. He says, the person who is looking backwards is not useful in the kingdom of God. And he gives the analogy of a plow, which is why it ties into the next part where he talks about the harvest. Have you ever tried to drive distracted and looking back at something? Poor Nehemiah, he's getting used in another illustration this morning. Nehemiah has this little gator, and he can drive really well. 
But if something happens that catches his attention, he will be driving, staring back, and you have to yell before he runs into something, the house, a trailer, something. Stop! Look where you're going! You know what happens when you're plowing a field and you look backwards? You plow crooked. Your focus is not there. The worker that is not focused on what God is calling him to do plows the crooked line. He looks and says, it's not useful. You ever done, play, you ever done something, got distracted in the midst of it and had to do it again? You start doing something and you mess up something cooking because you got distracted and burned something? I'm sure none of us have ever done that. This mindset of God, I'll do it, but... Every one of those things are distractions that cause us to divert off what God has commanded us to do. There needs to be immediacy. The understanding that this mindset makes us use, lose our usefulness in the kingdom of God. And then he goes on and he looks and he says, this is... This is what we're doing. He says, I'm taking you 70 and I'm sending you out to prepare for my, the cities for my coming as he is traveling from the Perean area to Jerusalem. The only divert he makes off on that is to go and lay, raise Lazarus and he is heading that way. And so he is going city by city to Jerusalem preparing, to, preparing them for, the coming, for his coming as he is going. And he says this, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. You see, one of the issues in the church is the people with the mindset to follow God that says, I'm willing to give up and not follow my desires, but follow His desires. Those are the few. You ever, want, you ever seen times where you get burnt out in ministry? I struggled with that. I was going to use this as an example. We have some wonderful people in this church who come and clean this church regularly. But we need more. And I know because they get burnt out, and I can see it on their faces. Because there's so, when you come in here and you look at all the stuff that needs to be done... <laughs> And realize this is more than what I can take on. All of these things, we need work, more workers that are willing to lay down their plans for the kingdom. And you look at this and he says, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. He says, There's going to be cities you go into that you will be rejected. He tells them, go out, don't take anything with you. Don't take extra clothes, don't take extra money. Depend on me. And so in the midst of this, they are leaving out knowing that they are going to be ridiculed. They know they're going to be rejected. And they know that they're not going to be able to depend upon themselves. They have to depend upon God. But what does he say? Jesus looks at them and says, be innocent, wise as serpent, yet innocent as doves. Sheep in the midst of wolves, but stay innocent in the midst of it. You're going to be rejected, but keep proclaiming. He looks and says, if you get rejected, what? Shake the dust off your feet and continue forward. How many of us has God calls us to, called us to do something, and the first time it got difficult, we dropped it? God, I can't do this. Jesus looks and says, you go to a city and that city rejects you, Stand outside of it, dust your feet off, tell them that they had an opportunity for the presence of the God to be there, and go what? Go proclaim in the next town. Keep on proclaiming. Don't stop because you've had a hiccup. Don't stop because there's been one failure. Don't stop because there's been one moment where you got ridiculed. Keep being obedient. Keep following no matter what. Keep on 
And trust the provisions of God. When he says, go out, don't take anything with you because the worker is worthy of their meals. He looks and says, you're out there doing the work of the kingdom. God is going to take care of everything else. I want you to look at this last part. Looking at verse 17 through 20. It says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus responds to them. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by, no, by any means hurt you. But he says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this part, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written where? In heaven. Church. Joy in your life will always be elusive while you are pursuing your desires. See, this is the great paradox of humanity and the state of humanity and the Christian life. God, Jesus said, if you want to gain your life, you must what? First, lose it. The more you chase after those things and go, okay, God, I want to follow you, but first let me do this. You think that but first is going to be something that fulfills you, and you chase it, and it's meaningless. The 70 who went out, even knowing they're going to be persecuted, even knowing they're going to be rejected, even knowing they're going to have to be dependent upon God, they return back with what? Joy. They rejoice in their obedience because they saw God move through them. And Jesus looks at him and says, Oh, but wait. Rejoice in the fact that you are a child of God and your name is written in heaven. In Romans 10, 14, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How will they know if no one is sent? We live in a time where the gospel needs to be proclaimed more than ever. But so many of us, and I'm speaking to myself because I do this. I am, I am not sitting here saying this is not something I try. I, trust me. I struggle with the Philip wants. My want list is a mile long. You want to know how you can know that? Look and see what your look at your Amazon list. You know, he can make your my list. <laughs> look how long lists get in those things. It's easy for me to begin to start chasing after the I wants. And God say, do this. And I say, I, I will. I'll do it. But first, let me do this. That mindset cripples our ability to be useful in the hands of God. We want to see revival happen. It begins with a people who look and say, God, I want to see your will done, not mine. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I don't want to try to find joy in the things of this world. I want to find joy in doing what you have called me to do. Lord, here am I. Send me. We have been given a holy and sacred calling church. And that will be the sermon topic for the next Sunday after next. We have been given a holy calling, and that is to be a light in this world. We, that's been the theme for this year, is being a light in this world. You can't be a light in this world when you are reflecting the things of this world, but when you are reflecting the heart of God. And we, church, if we want to see revival happen, 
We need to be a light in this world proclaiming the message of the gospel. That Jesus is coming. He sent the prophets to warn, and they killed the prophets. He sent John the Baptist ahead to warn. John the Baptist was beheaded. He sent forth the 70 disciples to tell the towns that he was coming. Today, he is sending the church to be the voice in the wilderness that says, prepare for the coming of the Lord. Families, be preparing your children. Be preparing your family members by telling, te- preaching the gospel. Be preparing your homes. Be preparing your heart. Be preparing your workplaces and everywhere that he sends you. That Jesus is coming and there is immediacy in the message because life is not guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. He could split the sky open tomorrow. Let us prepare for the coming of the Lord. Let's pray.